Hello, welcome to Macquarie University Liberal Club Sunday Sessions podcast, live from the Facebook main page. My name is Andrew Cremant and I'm joined with Lachlan Burke. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be with you. It's good to have you back on. On November 11th, 2020, 19 pro-democracy lawmakers announced their resignation from the parliament in Hong Kong as the, communist, as the Chinese Communist Party continued their takeover of the country. Today, we're fortunate enough to be speaking with one of those brave lawmakers now living in exile, Ted Hui, formerly of the Democratic Party in Hong Kong. Ted, welcome to Sunday Sessions. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Um, as always, you can ask your questions to Ted in the comments section, and we'll try to get to as many of them uh, throughout the hour. Um, firstly, tell us a bit about yourself uh, prior to 2019. Uh, prior to 2019, uh, I was just an ordinary uh, legislator, I would say. And of course, I'm from a major uh, party in favor of uh, fighting for freedom and democracy in Hong Kong. So that means uh, we have been in oppositions for a long time under the design, the design political uh, I mean, the design of our political systems, uh, even though we get popular votes uh, in half of the parliament seats, but we can never be uh, in place uh, for the government, be the government. So we've been uh, in oppositions for quite many years. So mm -hmm. personally, I've been a politician for uh, serving in the parliament for four years, but uh, in the municipal level, I've been in politics for a decade already. Wow. And be before that, things were more peaceful, and I didn't expect going into uh, a lot of confrontations with the government, even in uh, in oppositions. Of course, I wouldn't imagine myself in exile and charged criminally and risk uh, personal safety. Uh, the things have changed uh, very much. But yes, that's me before 2019, basically. Uh, what was it that caused China to decide to interfere with Hong Kong politics when it did? Yes, yeah, that's, that's a question asked by many when I'm overseas. Uh, because now, uh, especially among uh, the Australians, uh, Hong Kong's understood to be an, uh, quite an open and uh, free, uh, free city. Uh, even though it's a half democracy, but we had a lot of freedom uh, back before 2019. Um, but then it's it has a long history and background uh, of people uh, struggling for more freedom and democracy. It's not that we asked for more. It's that uh, when Hong Kong was handed back to mainland China in, uh, in 1997, we have been promised to have our own freedom. Uh, what's written in our mini constitution as uh, Hong Kong uh, ruling Hong Kong and a high degree of autonomy under a one country, two systems. So it's designed that uh, we are meant to be different from other cities in mainland China. We are meant to have our own freedom and step by step uh, progressing towards uh, a one man, one vote democracy. But it's now 25 years after the handover and uh, things uh, were okay in the first decade after the handover. It's mainly peaceful and we maintain our way of life. But then in recent years, uh, I think that uh, when we asked Beijing uh, to fulfill what it's promised in the basic law, our mini constitutions, Beijing refused and refused. So uh, all the democratic plans uh, has been delayed, all the political reform has been delayed, uh, to the point that Hong Kong has realized it's going to be fulfilled anymore. Beijing would not live up to what, it's, what it has promised in 1997. That's why uh, Hong Kong, uh, I would say, evolved from, um, from the beginning. They were very patiently waiting, negotiating in a, in a negotiation table with Beijing. And then we started peaceful protests. So uh, if the world remembers us, uh, we tried uh, very peaceful protests of participated by over a million or two million people uh, right. in the street. But then also, we also we evolved we, we, when we realized that uh, Beijing is eating its own words. We tried uh, civil disobedience 
we, we tried uh, sitting in the streets and blocking CBD Hong Kong, uh, but still very peacefully, but that didn't go anywhere. That's why we try more rad radical uh, physical confrontations in the streets. Uh, but then we, we grew so powerful, the Hong Kongers, and e even in an unfair design of the, our electoral political system, we were almost, we, people's support for democracy was so overwhelming in Hong Kong that even in a very, un, very um, unfair design of the system, we almost got half of the seats in the parliament. So yeah. I think that's the reason uh, Beijing saw it and were so afraid of the people's power, uh, both in the streets and with uh, elections, even in an unfair system. So Beijing saw that there's one day, and that's very soon, that Hong Kongers uh, will rise and it would become so uncontrollable. Um, the support for freedom and democracy was so strong that it, it's crossed the tipping point that it has to use means of uh, brutal crackdown in order to control, uh, to stay in control. I, I think that is why the tipping point was 2019 when uh, in the look in the munic municipal elections what they call the district council and people candidates for the democratic camp uh, uh, had a landslide win and also in the streets we were so powerful there were so many people in the streets and so it, it was a real uh, danger for beijing of losing control in hong kong that is why beijing was uh, thinking like um, it's time for complete control. So, so forget about the promises. Right. Did you notice that Beijing were not keeping its promises under Hu Jintao, or did it start with Xi Jinping? It, it's uh, even with Hu Jintao, but at that time, it was still at the early stage. So Hong Kong people still uh, had a little hope uh, that the leader of the country can change and hoping that the next leader Will be a better one will be a more open-minded one yeah. uh, giving more tolerance for freedom in hong kong but then when xi jinping uh, was up then we realized uh, it's gonna happen it's even a more of a dictator than all previous leaders in 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 the in the past that's why i would say all the brutal crackdowns and all the um oppressions started basically from xi jinping yeah, but not only him, but uh, he's, he's the most obvious turning point when it, when it's uh, Xi Jinping's, uh, when it was in place. Well, if I can ask, when, when did sort of Hong Kongers realise that Xi Jinping was going to be a greater dictator? Um, because, because, because in Australia, we were actually debating um, having an extradition treaty with China mm -hmm. um, while Xi Jinping was in power. This is, this is sort of early days. But we actually debated that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think even Hong Kongers themselves, they realized it pretty late. Um, we didn't realize, we, we, we thought even we didn't get democracy and the freedom uh, that we were promised, but then things would stay uh, in the status quo. We, we believed that before 2019. So because we had been having freedom for so many years, even after the handover, but then uh, we didn't realize in 2019 there was a brutal crackdown like that and riot police everywhere in the streets and all the monitoring, uh, scrutinization of the internet and uh, arresting everyone uh, from the parliament, disqualifying them. We couldn't imagine that. I think when it actually happened, uh, we realized uh, it's not a, a government uh that can be reasoned with so we, we, it's only that time we started calling it a regime not the government yeah we we are uh we we acknowledge that it's it's an illegitimate uh a government now we would say that so we we realized it very late i think uh so i think it's fair when if the the outside world doesn't know because we we didn't realize it early hmm. Um, we, you know, th there's a quote by, um, by Hegel, um, he says, one thing we learn from history is that we do not learn from history. Um, we spoke with uh, Neil James 
of the Australia Defence Insti uh, Association uh, a couple of weeks back, um, and he mentioned that uh, Stalin did not believe that Hitler was going to invade the Soviet Union, even though Hitler had greater numbers of troops at the Soviet border, even more so than Putin did at the Ukraine border. Um, you know, with with that in mind, do you see sort of a, a, a Chinese style takeover of another country? Um, like, do you, like do you see that brewing? In other countries around the world and do you see similar people similar people dismissing it dismissing the possibility that what happened in hong kong could happen there yeah i i agree and i do see that and mm -hmm. i i must confess i i made these confessions uh in, in public as well mm -hmm. that uh, hong kong uh, took our own freedom for granted in the past because we we've been enjoying it for for decades for hundreds of years i would say um uh, for decades, not not that long, and um, we thought it it would last. We even with the CCP's uh, governance uh, in the early stage, it was it was okay. So you didn't see any crackdowns, and we basically had our own freedoms. It's just that we didn't have a true one man one vote democracy uh, transition of government. But th but then lives life went on. We didn't imagine terrible things would happen. I I think this is a lesson. Uh, this lesson of Hong Kong should be learned by the world. That even in the past, uh, the CCP regimes can be peaceful when doing businesses, trade with the world, and going into international organizations. But one day, when the dictator uh, was rising, it feels uh, it has more power than everyone. Then it would start being aggressive. And it will be, and I can see that uh, invasions like uh, Russia towards Ukraine can can happen from China. It can invade Taiwan, invade small countries in the uh, South China Sea, and that's totally possible. And don't think that it's uh, it's that remote. It can happen anytime. And just on the back of that, do you think that the response of the international community to uh, the risks uh, that China poses and their actions in Hong Kong, do you think they've been enough? Do you think they take the risk seriously enough? Uh, yes and no. It's a difficult question because uh, even in 2019, when the brutal crackdowns was in place and the world saw from the TV that, you know, all the tear gas and all the terrible weapons, uh, rubber bullets, water cannons were used, and and the police baton was beating up everyone, young protesters in Hong Kong. Um, leaders in, in the world have issued strong statement in support of Hong Kong. And also people, a country like Australia just recently uh, released its safe haven plans. Uh, it's called the Hong Kong Stream for Hong Kongers to, to settle in Australia when they have the, the urgent need to flee the country, people like me. So there are uh, measures and strong statements in place. Uh, but then if you compare to the situation now when Russia is invading Ukraine, there are stronger support and more direct actions by countries, uh, free countries in the world. Of course, you can't compare the crackdown in Hong Kong of to the war in Ukraine. But then I, I think now after a few years, after from 2019's Hong Kong crackdown, the world realized more that China's nature uh, is a dictatorship and it can be brutal and it can be, there can be oppressions uh, towards the world. I think back three years ago uh, in 2019, the world was thinking like, uh, it's only an oppression towards a free city, uh, one city, but not realizing that it would expand to as a uh, very imminent threat to the world. But now it realized it, it's a bit late. Like uh, I, I, I remember a representative from the UN, uh, from the EU, uh, when he's having a conversation with the Taiwanese leader, uh, it also said that uh, even the EU was res not responding strong enough uh, to support Taiwan and putting Taiwan into uh, uh, its uh, dangerous status today. 
So I'm wishing personally, I, I'm grateful for the world support you know, in support of Hong Kong's freedom, um, even in Australia. But I, I think uh, there's always more that can be done. For, for example, uh, more, more uh, direct action like sanctions, like the US is doing, sanctioning uh, Beijing and Hong Kong officials for the oppression in Hong Kong. Uh, that's not been done, not even by the UK, not even by EU, and not, not by Australia. Now Australia has its own Magnitsky Act. I think it's uh, really time uh, to consider using that. Hmm. What What have been the responses um, to the CCP across the world? Like I suppose beyond that, um, you know, do you know? Like, do you believe that this is enough? Uh, the responses, right? Um, yeah. No, uh, I, I, I think it's the the world's responses is going towards the directions of more. Uh, isolating and boycotting approach and that is exactly correct but i i, I think that the struggle or the dilemma is always that uh, china remains a very strong economic power and there's a lot of business economic relationships uh with china which, uh, i think australia is the best example uh import and export in, into and from china is very frequent and so it's, it's very it's a big part of australia's economy mm. so uh the dilemma is that when you shake hands when you do business with the ccp regimes um there should be a bottom line the bottom line is that you maintain your own uh value for freedom and democracy you don't compromise it anywhere and you do you you have to see through all the infiltrations and all the soft economic power it's influencing uh different communities in uh in your own country I think that's a bottom line. Like just taking one example in the education sectors, and there are a huge number of Chinese student, students, international student, students into universities. Uh, they have become very important income source for universities. So uh, to, to, the, uh, to the effect that it becomes so sensitive when people like me, Tab Hui, uh, in, in, from the CCP's regime's uh, point of view, I'm a criminal. A scorner and also a fugitive on the run. So when I when it happens that I give uh, public speeches in universities, when university itself can be pressured to the point, uh, can be pressured by Chinese embassies or don't let Ted Ho into your universities, I think that would be crossing the line of uh, losing its own uh, freedom of a uh, freedom of uh, speech and freedom to uh, academic studies so i i think there should be a bottom line and on that subject we've seen that uh drew pavlou was arrested in eastwood which has a predominantly chinese population a population of chinese expats because of a, an altercation with some residents who were sympathetic to xi jinping mm -hmm. so why do you think there are some people in australia who feel this way and what do you think uh, we could do about the influence of those ideas over here? Uh, yes, um, I I believe that quite many Chinese communities in Australia, uh, they are from mainland China, and they have settled in Australia for quite a long time. So they have been uh, back in their home countries in China. They have been brainwashed very much, uh, especially uh, in the past with uh, very organized um, united fronting work done by the CCP, that's, uh, if that's uh, infiltration. So they have educated their own people to believe that all the, those Hong Kongers uh, fighting for freedom and democracy in Hong Kong are rioters. They have asked too much. They already have their own freedom. Now they want to take over the country and trying to get uh, to be an independent state, and that's why they are all against the, the countries. And they've become, they've educated those people in a way that uh, it's uh, being patriotic mm -hmm. to protect your, the country in any way. So if there's any um, any criticism when people are being critical towards China, they are unpatriotic, and so that's why. They become uh, sympathetic. I wouldn't say sympathetic. They are quite brainwashed, but uh, I don't blame them too much because that's the way they're educated. But uh, with uh, 
through people like Drew Pavlou, I, I still have to say that the, the local police can be a bit insensitive when doing arrests. I mean, he, he is a radical person and he might not, uh, the police might not like him, but think about what, the, what are the values behind it uh, uh, that it represents. It's standing up against uh, even uh, greater evil and oppressor, human rights, abusers. Then you, then I, I think the police could have done better to be more sensitive, uh, to know uh, which side Australia is on. Mm. Um, do you know of any examples of countries that have decoupled themselves economically from China? Um, we've got we've got a few um, uh, questions and comments from the audience. One says, "When the world puts the eggs in one basket by giving main, by giving jobs to mainland China and making them rich, the money allows the political power to go to Chinese Communist Party ideology." As the saying goes, where the money goes, the politics follow. And following, yeah. and following that, uh, during the protests of 2019, we have seen people like LeBron James having uh, revealing um, ignorance of the situation and revealing the NBA's um, relationship with China. And this expands to Hollywood um, when they release uh, movies um, sort of catering to the Chinese market. So like, are there proper examples of either, either countries or companies that have properly decoupled themselves? Mm -hmm. um, I, it's hard to say one example, one nation and one industry is doing that. But to be fair, um, I think the world is doing that. If most free countries are, are doing that. And as I said, um, it, it's of, of course ideal uh, for those countries to reduce economic reliance uh, in terms of product, importing products from China and also in a way supporting China, China, the Chinese economy. Um, it, it's okay. Think, think about uh, uh, international uh, relations and economic relations. It's okay to do business. Um, but then when it comes term to when, when CCP regimes uh, openly ask country to shut up in, in terms of supporting Hong Kong, in, in terms of letting people like me in the country and denying uh, human rights abuses at all uh, in a very uh, oppressive, uh, aggressive and wolf warrior way. And I think it's time uh, for those countries and industries to really hold back. It takes time. You cannot cut all, all business relationships uh, uh, overnight, but these countries and the leaders should be stepping back backward to the other directions. There are many uh, uh, other alternatives countries that you can do business with in terms of those products. Think about uh, India, right? So think about Japan and Southeast Asian free countries. There, there are choices with Taiwan. And I, I think with that directions clearer and people can feel more relieved that uh, one day my country will not be infiltrated, my country will not koto or back down because just to do business with China. Oops, excuse me. In light of the West's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which included sanctions and economic decoupling, do you think that uh, Western uh, countries are getting less patient in terms of mollifying dictators? I think so. And I, I think to many leaders in the world, uh, the Russian invasion uh, can be a, a bit of a surprise, not a total surprise, but uh, that it happened so fast and it became so imminent. And suddenly the, they, they feel that the threat can, not, can be to, not only towards Ukraine and can be towards the world. And it also sees that uh, very more, more clearly from the war, uh, who's behind Russia and that's China. And I think that's crystal clear now. China is su supporting Russia indirectly. So, um, and there are of course, uh, more than speculations that China will do the same to Taiwan. So I, I, I believe the world is now uh, countries, free countries, uh, on one side, uh, together in one camp, uh, has realized much more uh, that China is a real, real imminent threat to the world. 
uh, I think it's grow, it grew stronger than uh, before, but even back a few years ago when uh, trouble happened in Hong Kong, at that time, uh, the West would adopt a wait and see approach towards China. And nowadays with uh, China supporting Russia and the world knows, and I, I believe it's a, it's a direct, uh, right direction to go. Can you explain to us how China is supporting Russia? In their war. Can you explain to us how China is supporting Russia indirectly in the war? Well, I, I think it's very clear, especially when you see voting in UN meetings, that China is always abstain, abstaining. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, when everyone is uh, condemning uh, the violence used, and China is not condemning at all, and it's it's more understanding uh, it's trying to stay in the middle but when you know when when evil things are happening in one place and you're trying to be neutral and you're trying trying to not say anything that's not justice at all and especially when all, all the medias in in China and now nowadays also in Hong Kong they are tightly controlled by the regime not to use the word invasion uh, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, from the Russian side, they are still using the conflict and special military actions very much in line with the propaganda with Russia. So now that you can see, uh, it's supporting it in, in a way. And of course, there's no direct evidence that is supporting it militarily and in terms of funds, but you can see the attitude that it's understanding, it's tolerating, it's uh, considering Russia uh, as an ally, then someone who is, uh, who, who, who's a dictator, who's, who's a killer for millions of uh, families in Ukraine and in Europe. Now, you, you see that attitude very clearly. Uh, what is some of the legislation enacted by the CCP in Hong Kong that you think that people should pay attention to? Yeah, in Hong Kong, uh, the most uh, noticeable uh, legislation is called the National Security Law. So with that law, uh, that, that law was not even discussed in Hong Kong's parliament uh, when I was in place. And, and that law was more like a decree from Beijing it was enacted in, in Beijing, not in Hong Kong, but forcibly, forcibly written into Hong Kong's uh, mini constitution, the basic law, that suddenly overnight it was in place before the legislation was uh, taken back uh, and was passed. Hong Kongers was not even consulted and we, were, we haven't seen uh, even the text of the legislations before it, it was passed. So it is quite terrible. So in, in, inside that law, national security law, and uh, there, there are four, four offenses. And I think more notice, uh, noticeable would be uh, collusion with foreign forces. So if for people talking with you uh, in public and overseas, it would be seen uh, a crime of mm. being critical uh, towards China and asking uh, foreign uh, countries uh, to put up sanctions and to boycott, uh, even boycotting the Beijing Olympics, it, it will be criminal if you ask to do that openly. And of course, with uh, subverting state power under the national security law. So we, we the Democrats, uh, uh, before 2019, when there was at least half of the free elections in the parliament, we were organizing a primary elections among the Democrats to see, uh, to try to maximize uh, the number of seats in parliament. But even with the primary elections itself, it would seem to be illegal uh, because the regime was accusing us, uh, was, uh, was we were trying to use, make use of the elections to take over state powers, uh, to paralyze the whole parliament that's why it's all been declared criminal. And that, that is why all my parliamentarian uh, colleagues, even we were uh, democratically elected, suddenly we, we were disqualified 
and was arrested and put to jail even before the real election came. So with these, you can see uh, everyone can be put to jail very easily with the national security law, not to mention that people uh, speaking critically uh, on, on social media. And there was a fine example of uh, a group of uh, speech therapists and they have come into uh, organizations uh, publishing uh, kids' cartoons and being uh, ironic and and criticizing the regimes and uh, supporting Hong Kong's freedom protests. And the whole organization of speech therapists were uh, disbanded and they were put to jail and refused bail. So even with uh, publishing cartoons and there's no freedom of speech, no freedom of expressions. So Hong Kong has turned totally into a normal Chinese city without all kinds of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. And un under that law, we, even people, uh, Hong Kong is going, taking it to the streets. Um, now it's impossible. So there's no any demonstration and protest in the streets uh, for three, consecutive years, and that never happened to Hong Kong before. Right. We, um, you mentioned that if you break Chinese, if you're considered to have broken Chinese law anywhere in the world, Chinese will, re will recognize that as you breaking the law. Um, would that mean that in the future, if there were other countries that decide to put forward an extradition treaty with China, they could potentially ask said countries to bring someone back to the mainland? because they've been seen to have broken the law even prior to the treaty being um, being signed. Um, that's possible, but um, I, I'm glad that uh, it, during 2019, most uh, free countries in the world have suspended extradition laws uh, with China, including Australia. That's why I, I can still stay here safely. Yeah. But then uh, extraditions with China, there are still quite many countries that has that agreement with China, uh, including uh, places like Belgium and South Korea. And it, it, it's hard to imagine those are free countries, but they, will, they still have an extradition agreement. So, uh, yes, the, the, the national security law and different kind of Chinese law, they have what we call the international law arms. They'll be monitoring people like me uh, speaking against the Chinese government. And when we travel uh, to those uh, Beijing friendly countries, they can always uh, exercise their extradition power uh, to detain me and send me back to China. That's quite possible. That's why even now I'm in Australia, but when I have to travel uh, to other countries to do advocacy work, I have to choose very carefully which country I can uh, stay to do my transit. So for example, if I have to go to Europe, and that's al it's almost impossible for me to have any transit in the Middle East and in authoritarian countries, not even Singapore, I wouldn't be safe in Singapore. So I have to um, travel direct, uh, direct flight or travel uh, to the US first. People ask me to travel to Japan for transit and then to Europe, Europe. but then uh, with that route, I have to fly over Chinese air, and I wouldn't feel safe myself. Right. So yes, uh, the long arm of the CCP oppression is, is existing, and it's threatening not only me, but all Hong Kongers, even they are overseas, even they are in Australia. That's why when you see Hong Kongers uh, protesting outside Chinese embassies in Australia, they are always hiding their faces and uh, putting up masks. And that, that is why, because one day they have to return home uh, to meet the relatives, deal with their assets, and there'll be a rest. Now it's, it's a, a very real threat in, among Hong Kongers when they have to fly back to Hong Kong, when they land, when they go through immigration, they are, very, they are quite frightened that, oh, would there be any trouble? Would the regime be looking at my phones? And, oh, you have a picture with Ted Hoi and you have participated in protests outside the Chinese embassy, they will be in trouble. Do you feel relatively safe in Australia or do you feel that your safety could be at risk even here? I, I feel safe in general when I was in Australia and I'm in Australia. In the first 
few months, I would be still a bit paranoid. I would uh, look back and to see who's in my bag and who's peeking. And I, I would say I'm more like uh, very much trained because uh, back in Hong Kong, uh, the period before I left Hong Kong, I've been followed by the CCP regimes, the, um, the intelligence people uh, of the CCP uh, and, and also National Security Police. They were following me everywhere. And not only me, but my also my family. So even I was a legislator, they would always, there, there would be also always a vehicle parked in the car park of the legislature. Mm -hmm. And there will be always four undercover police uh, staying in the vehicle and watching your every step, even inside the parliament. So you can see how intense it is and I, when, when it's outside the parliament. So I, I was very much trained. I, I, I used to, used to te ex describe uh, my situation in Hong Kong like this. When I was driving in Hong Kong, I had to look at the rear mirror more than I look at the front because they're always behind my back. Yeah, that, that's very uh, realistic. Yeah, to me. So I've been very well trained off to see whether there are people following me. But no, luckily, I, I was worried that the Chinese embassy would send people yeah, to follow me around. But after a year, maybe they, they are not so rich to pay the people. So I don't, I don't feel being followed. I feel relatively quite safe in Australia. That's good. It's one of, the, one of those blessings that we sometimes take for granted living here. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any um, other lawmakers or activists currently living in exile that you believe deserve a lot of attention? Uh, yes, but they are known to the public. Yeah, like uh, my uh, my former uh, parliamentarian colleague, Nathan Law, and he's living in exile in the UK. And he's still uh, advocating for freedoms in Hong Kong in high profile. And also there are quite a few also in, in the US. Uh, but there are not many of us who were lucky enough to make their way out. And wow. so majority of them are serving their time in jail or uh, under under detention, waiting, waiting for their trial. And I expect that they would stay in trial for quite a long time as the main figure in the opposition. So I, I don't think I will see them again yeah, in my life. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, it, oh, Lachlan's got one. Uh, when you look at the future of Hong Kong, do you feel hopeful? Uh, yes and no. Uh, not hopeful because um, now within Hong Kong, Hong Kongers can't do anything or say anything or they risk being thrown in jail. They can't rely on the streets because it's banned by the, the regime that they cannot protest. They cannot rely on uh, the parliament because even the half democracy was gone. Now the whole parliament was appointed by Beijing. They can't rely on the media because media, free media organizations were forced to disband themselves. And quite a few uh, more organized uh, critic media critical towards Beijing now has been prosecuted. and. The, the leaders are being thrown at, in jail. So they can't rely on these means to express themselves, to ask for international help and to mobilize people uh, in Hong Kong. So in, in this sense, not hopeful. But in, but in another sense, after 2019, I would say uh, Hong Kongers were so woken up. So even uh, people, ordinary citizens who are not interested in politics at all, but they were they participated in 2019. It was an all people movement. So that, that's why it was so overwhelming for, for Beijing. So with what happened in 2019, Hong Kongers will never forget mm. uh, what the regime has done to us. And it will never forgive the CCP regimes. It will never allow, tolerate it being uh, the government forever, but they have to stay low key, uh, low profile. They are waiting for an opportunity. So, oh, I, I'm I'm hopeful and I'm still optimistic because people's hearts have not died. They the spirits are still high. Hong Kongers are still very angry 
at the government. They are waiting for an opportunity and any opportunity it comes, they will rise against. For example, if some somehow they were given a chance to have a uh, legal protest in the streets, I'm sure more, more than 2 million people will turn up very mm -hmm. angrily. So now we are relying on uh, the Hong Kong diaspora uh, overseas and people like me uh, mobilizing the Hong Kongers and our international allies uh, to give Hong Kong support and also organizing ourselves into an international civil society uh, that we, we lost in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong used to be a very diverse and pluralistic uh, civil societies and with different NGOs, but now they are all gone. They have gone overseas. So I, I, I would rely on that and to keep the Hong Kong spirit high and to be influential in internationally, like what I'm doing, so talking to politicians, NGOs and communities uh, to tell our stories, to, to remind of the CCP spread in Hong Kong so that the world uh, will learn this lesson. So uh, in that sense, I can see the world has, uh, has changed its attitude towards China. So I, I don't think this uh, so-called superpower will, will last forever. Uh, it will collapse and dictators uh, if you believe, believe in democratic theories, dictators uh, tend to make decisions that can can be irreversible, mistakes that can be irreversible, that it will collapse one day. We are preparing ourselves to, to receive that day. That day will come. And if the regime were to collapse, uh, what would your vision for the political future of Hong Kong look like if, uh, if the people could uh, have self-determination? Would you like to see it as an independent state? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think even um, among Hong Kongers, we are still having a discussion about that. And it, it's quite early to, to talk about that. Some quite many uh, will be supporting Hong Kong to become an independent state. And, and when there are other groups of Hong Kongers who believe that uh, it's better to, uh, to be part of Brit uh, Britain, because we've been under British uh, governance for quite a long time, uh, adapted to their culture. And there are quite many uh, who, who don't really care as long as Hong Kong has its own freedom and democracies and uh, in under what form and which government, and it's quite debatable. But I, I think for now we have won uh, more, more uh, 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 one common goal, that is to, to get CCP to step down from power and to stay away from Hong Kong. So it's different from Hong Kongers have uh, transformed in the past. Uh, we would ask international allies uh, to give strong statements to restore Hong Kong back to its political order, to go back to our own basic law, one country, two system uh, that we used to be lived in. But now I think we have gone one step further. We ask the world not to believe in one country, two system. It just won't work. And I think in, in the past 25 years, it's, it's been proven that it, it doesn't work. It only, it's because uh, start from day one, Beijing have not even thought about uh, living up with to its promises and giving real freedom and democracy to Hong Kong. So now we, we believe that uh, when CCP is in place, uh, we will not have our own freedom at all and democracy at all. So it has to be gone. Uh, I think the world would be more in line with us with that thought because it, it will be harder for, for countries like Australia to, to, to issue a statement uh, to say that uh, Hong Kong should have its own uh, self-determination. It's, it's more sensitive, but then I, I think that's, that's more practical. If you're supporting Hong Kong, then, then CCP's regime has to step away from Hong Kong. Hmm. Um, if I can just change uh, track slightly, I know we've, uh, we're running out of time. Um, mm -hmm. China is pursuing its own net zero blueprint. Um, mm -hmm. They're opening up many coal-powered uh, plants while the rest of the West are, are trying to transition to renewables due to the various climate change agreements. Um, you held a portfolio in environmentalism mm -hmm. and climate change. Do you think there's a double standard 
that puts China that that sets China aside from these talks about climate change. It's a double standard, and as far as I understand from Hong Kong, and as as far as I understand Chinese uh, green policies, that all the green policies um, and measures and goals in Hong Kong uh, in uh, made by CCP regimes, it's part of the propaganda that China can be a leader uh, for the world, but it never had any determinations at, or, or real discussions among China of mm -hmm. how they should be inter implemented. It's not rooted in their values. It's, it's, on, it's in their mouth, it's lip servicing. Yeah. Um, so you can see uh, for the past decades when China was growing rapidly with its economy and all the uh, production industries, it never really limited uh, its uh, expansion in terms of uh, building factories and and it it has announced many uh, promises and goals in their policy, but they've never been really monitored and it they never really matter when it comes when they compare that to the incomes and the GDPs and the uh, per capita they can earn. Uh, in in their, uh, their 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 platforms and their mission statements of the government, they're always uh, stressing uh, the great economic achievements uh, uh, that uh, that they are proud of, and that's never been done before, unprecedented in history. But they've never mentioned anything done to the pollution and to the world. It, it never matters to them. So yes, it's a double standard. It's more than a double standard. It's a lie. I mean, I mean given given that in Europe you're getting farmers in, in multiple countries protesting against their governments due to you know, you know due to certain plans they're um, they're willing to introduce um, in order to fight climate change, and mm -hmm. China you know is of course going in the complete opposite direction, but mm -hmm. they get no. I mean, I mean, we've mentioned the double standard. You've mentioned the lies, but. Even the international community barely calls them out, and they're supposedly calling it sort of the greatest existential crisis of our time, even more so than potential nuclear conflict with either Russia or China. Mm. Um, I I think it's either the world has not seen clearly, or they have a vested interest somehow, and because they are, it's a economic partner with them, so they tend to be more tolerating that. They should shouldn't be in 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 my in my standard. So um, yes, it it shouldn't tolerate this kind of double standard, this this lie anymore from now. Hmm. Um, and just finally, um, are there any are there any uh, books or podcasts that you might recommend um, to students um, in order to study up either about the situation in Hong Kong, about uh, about communist infiltration of um, of other countries? What what do you recommend? Um, there are quite many, but not many are in English. Uh, I I, re I regret that, and um, I, I I will try to look and to see the English versions of them so that the communities and local students can have a look. I can send that to you uh, after the after the show. All right. Well, thank thank you very much. We are no we are out of time. Uh, Ted mm -hmm. Hui, formerly of the Democratic Party in Hong Kong, thank you so much for coming on to Sunday sessions. Yeah, thank you. Keep in touch. We will. We will. This has been a Macquarie University Liberal Club production. My name is Andrew Kremen. I've been joined by Lachlan Burke. We will see you next time. Goodbye. Okay. Bye-bye.